Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. And I pray now, Lord, as we look into your word, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit and mold me and fill me and use me. Uh, and I pray that you would open your heart to our, or open your word to our hearts and, and, uh, and apply it to our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone wrote down, this appeared in a newspaper years ago, but uh, several children's notes written to the pastor of their church. And just some quick little notes, and I, I have them here. Uh, the first one says, Dear Pastor, please share in your sermon that Peter Peterson has been a good boy all week. Signed, Peter Peterson. <laughs> Dear Pastor, my father should be a minister. Every day he gives us a sermon about something. Or this one, Dear Pastor, I'm sorry I can't leave more money in the plate, but my father didn't give me a raise in my allowance. Could you have a sermon about a raise in my allowance? <laughs> I like that line of thinking. Dear Pastor, I would like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there. <laughs> so, there you go. Family harmony. Dear Pastor, I think a lot more people would come to your church if you moved it to Disneyland. That's probably true. And maybe we could charge the same admittance. Uh, I don't know, admi admission. Dear Pastor, please say a prayer for our little league team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. Thank you. Is that what the Cubs need too? Is that... Oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't help that. Dear Pastor, my father says I should learn the Ten Commandments, but I don't think I want to because we have enough rules already in my house. So, Dear Pastor, are there devils on earth? I think there might be one in my Sunday school class. So... That might have been from the teacher, I'm not sure. <laughs> Dear Pastor, I liked your sermon on Sunday, especially when it was finished. That's, that sounds like something one of my kids would write. All right, now, those notes are, are cute because we understand them to be written by children, right? Uh, what if they were written by adults? They wouldn't be so cute anymore, would they? Uh, they would... They would just be weird or immature. Uh, and, and when a sinner is saved by grace, he becomes a baby Christian. Remember being a baby Christian? For some of you, uh, for, for some of you that was years. Years ago. For me, it was uh, 18, 18 years ago for me when I became a baby Christian, was born again. Uh, but we're not to remain baby Christians. We are uh, to grow up. The Lord wants us to be mature adults as Christians. But more than that, the Lord wants His church to be a mature church. He wants our church to grow that way. Grow in maturity as a body. And that happens as each individual person grows in maturity. But He wants us to know if that's happening. Do you remember... Uh, maybe you did this growing up, and maybe you did it for your kids. As they were growing up, you'd line them up on that one special door frame in the house and mark, and mark in pencil or something. Uh, here, here he is at seven years old and a little higher, a little while later at eight years old, and you wouldn't expect it to go down. You would expect it to go up, right? And, and so you would put out, you would show markers of physical growth. Well, the Lord gives us markers of spiritual maturity, markers of growth in that area. And how can you tell if our church is a mature church? How, how can we measure the maturity of Grace Baptist Church? And we do that because Christ gave us some of the, some of the marks by which we can measure maturity in our church. And so Paul mentioned these marks too. In Ephesians chapter 4 last week, we spoke of the first of these marks, and that is unity in Christ. The mature church is marked by unity in Christ. And remember, Christ had given us two pillars upon which we can build or lay the foundation of unity in our church. And those two footings or two pillars are, are the, the unity of the faith, unity of the faith, and unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. And those two pillars 
really hold up unity in Christ in the church. And this morning I want to uh, continue speaking about that unity in Christ as a mark of maturity in the church. Uh, and then I hope to cover um, at least some of the other marks of maturity when we uh, get there. We'll see how far we go. But uh, uh, I want each of us individually to see as we, as we look at these marks, I want us to commit to do our part. I want to commit to do my part to ensure that our church measures up to the marks of maturity. So let's look at the marks of maturity in the church, shall we? In, in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 11, we'll read down through verse 16. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 11, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Note back in verse 13 where it says that it, we come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man. And perfect here means mature, complete, um, not lacking in, in the things that, that it would be lacking in if it was immature. It, he is talking about coming to, as a church body, mature manhood. If you imagine it as the body pictured in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think, um, and uh, the Bible pictures Christ church as a body and not everybody's an eyeball and not everybody's an ear or a foot or a hand. He goes through that whole thing. And so if you think of the church as a body, we're talking about coming to maturity. That is the goal of Christ for the church. And the first mark of that maturity is the, the mature church must be marked by unity, but not just any unity, but rather unity in Christ. And so Christ as we said, it's given these two pillars. As we saw there in verse 13, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Those two pillars hold up unity in Christ. And it must be of Him and through Him and in Him. The faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. But the Lord gives us more than just these two pillars upon which to build unity. Christ gives us Something else gives us a uniting influence to guide us in that unity so that the building on these pillars, so that the building is done according to code, so to speak, so that the building matches the foundation. And what is the uniting influence that Christ gives us? Well, Christ gives the church gifted men to guide her to unity. Christ gives certain gifted men to the church. He has set this up this way that the church would be led in the right direction, if the, that the building would be, would be constructed with, with leadership according to Christ. There are under shepherds. He is the chief shepherd. There are, there are gifts that He's given. And we go back here to verse 11. Uh, verse 11, and He gave, this is Christ giving, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so there is what He gave is gifted Men And the first group that he gave of gifted men is apostles and prophets. He gave these apostles and prophets. The apostles were 12 men chosen by Christ with Matthias replacing Judas Iscariot. Judas had uh, failed in his apostleship. And so uh, Paul was chosen also after Jesus' resurrection as a unique apostle to the Gentiles. And so there were 13 Apostles all together in the New Testament. An apostle has some qualifications. Not everybody can be an apostle. In fact, very few people could ever be an apostle. An apostle must 
To be qualified to be an apostle, you have to be directly chosen by Jesus Christ. All right, that is not the same as being called to be a pastor uh, or some other calling. Because to be directly chosen by Christ, by the, the uh, Bible means by that to actually have a conversation with Jesus. All right? And have him tell you personally, you're an apostle. All right? And uh, nobody alive today can make that claim, by the way. But uh, an apostle had to be directly chosen by Christ. Mark chapter 3 and verse 13 says, And he goeth, that's Jesus, goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. And he gave them power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And it goes on speaking of this. So there is Christ ordaining the first twelve apostles. And then Judas would fail out of that. Of course, he knew that would happen. And then he would appoint Matthias and then the Apostle Paul last of all. An apostle had to be directly chosen by Christ. An apostle, another qualification is this, an apostle must be an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. He must have personally seen Jesus in his resurrected body. That's one reason why Judas Iscariot never made it to full apostleship. He went out and hung himself even before Jesus was hung on the cross. So Judas Iscariot never did see Jesus in his resurrected form. But uh, an apostle had to be an eyewitness of Christ's resurrection. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 22, the, the early church is meeting and the apostles are meeting and there's 11 of them left and they come up with the idea and they're led by, by the Holy Spirit to say, hey, you know, we had 12 and Judas failed. We need to appoint another one. And so they appeal to God on this. In uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 22, we see some of these qualifications. And he says, Beginning from the baptism of John, unto the same day he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be witness with us of his resurrection. There is the qualification that Peter is telling to the rest of the church. We need to ordain another one to be a witness with us of his resurrection. If you reach, read through the whole book of Acts and look at how many times the apostles, the Bible says in the book of Acts, gave witness of his resurrection. Just underlined it when next time you read through the book of Acts. And they're always giving witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Specifically, they're telling people, especially in Jerusalem, you crucified Christ, He rose again, we know because we saw Him. That was their message. I mean, that was just the, the basic part of their message because they were apostles. And they were eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they appointed two in verse 23 of Acts chapter 1. Joseph called Barsabas, whose surname was Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Thou, Lord, knowest the hearts of all men. Show whether, these two, show whether of these two thou hast chosen, that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so, now there's twelve again, completing that, that number of the original 12 that Jesus had called. And then Paul would later be called to apostleship on the road to Damascus as he was traveling in Acts chapter 9 to persecute the church. And a light shines around him and so bright that he falls off of his, off of his animal that he's riding. And, and the voice calls out and it's Jesus. And he says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Jesus said, or Paul says, Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. There he witnesses the resurrected Christ. And Paul, or Saul, whose name was Saul, was changed a little bit there to Paul, and he would go forth preaching and saying, I have seen him. He rose from the dead. And he was personally appointed and, uh, by the resurrected Christ, and he saw him. The basic meaning of apostle. The word is apostolos. Is, it simply means one who is sent on a mission. And the apostles of Christ were Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, Matthias, and the apostle Paul. Judas falling out of that. So those, those were the qualified men. Those were the apostles given by Christ 
to the church. Christ gave His apostles miraculous power. And the reason why He did that is so that it would authenticate their message. They were making some pretty wild claims. They were claiming, first of all, that all the Old Testament prophecies had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And then they were saying, besides that, this Messiah is the man Jesus who was crucified as a common criminal. And now, after three days in the grave, He rose again. That's quite a claim to make. And so, Christ gave them miraculous power, signs of apostleship to perform. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul is defending his apostleship to those who are denying it in the church of Corinth. And he says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he says, Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Paul says, uh, here's how you can know I'm an apostle and my message is authentic because when I was with you, you saw the signs of apostleship in me. Words and wonders and mighty deeds. Peter, in, in Acts chapter 3 and verse 6, is going with John into the temple and there's a man sitting there begging. And he looks at Peter as if Peter's going to give him money. And Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I'll give you. And then he says, arise, Take up your bed and walk. The man was lame from his youth and he rises, he stands up, grabs his bed and walks. Hey, that is a pretty cool thing. That is an authentication type sign of an apostle. The apostle Paul was shipwrecked and they wash up on shore and it's cold and it's raining. They build a fire and he's throwing sticks into the fire and he didn't check real close because one of them was a snake and it was venomous snake, uh, one that everybody on the island knew about and it bit onto his hand. And what does he do? He shook it off into the flame. And then they're looking around and, and they say, that's karma. This guy killed somebody, got away with it, and now karma or justice won't let him live. And then they're looking at him, no, nothing's happening. He's a god. Well, he wasn't quite a god. He was an apostle. All right? And he got him straightened out on that. And I'm glad that I don't have to perform that sign of apostleship. I don't want to get bit by anything. Amen. Um, but, uh, and so they had these miraculous powers. In Ephesians chapter 3, these gifted men, both apostles and prophets, were the recipient, recipients of God's revelation. If you look in Ephesians chapter 3 and just flip the page over there to verse 5, it says, um, talking of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto His holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. And so the apostles were the ones in the New Testament, along with the prophets, receiving brand new revelation from God, and then they wrote it down. Uh, in the Bible. And even books that are not written by apostles were written under the direction of apostles. And so, uh, every book of the New Testament written either directly by an apostle or under the authority and supervision of an apostle. And so, of course, Christ gave us this gift of apostleship to the church. There are those who would like to counterfeit that gift. And if someone today tells you that they are, they are an apostle, uh, maybe check and see if you're thinking the same thing they're thinking. Uh, maybe, maybe there might be a misunderstanding. But if they're claiming to be an apostle of Christ in this sense, they are lying to you and trying to counterfeit a gift. There's nothing worse than getting a cheap imitation as a gift, right? And, uh, and so uh, the, uh, you, you don't want to mess with that. But uh, so Christ gives us the apostles, and He also gives us the church, the prophets. And this refers to New Testament prophets rather than those of the Old Testament. They would already have been given to all believers, but specifically given to the church. The prophets sometimes spoke revelation from God. And sometimes they simply expounded on revelation already given from God. Uh, they always spoke for God, but did not always give newly revealed messages from God. Uh, the prophets were second to the apostles in their messages. And their message was to be judged by the apostles, according to 1 Corinthians 
14 and verse 37. So if someone claimed to be a prophet and they stood up and gave a prophecy and it did not mesh with what the apostles taught, then they would be known to be in the first century church a false prophet. Everything was to be judged by the apostles' doctrine. Um, but there was a New Testament prophet in the, in the book of Acts named Agabus. You ever read about Agabus? Agabus was a prophet from the Jerusalem church, and there was a meeting at the Antioch church in which Agabus was sent to that meeting. And in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, Agabus gives direct revelation from God. And he says, and it, it, um, the record says, and in those days came prophets from Jerusalem into Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And based on that prophecy, the churches around about were able to take up a collection and to prepare for that coming famine. Uh, does the church still have the apostles and prophets today? Yes, they do. Yes, we do. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says of the church that they are the foundation. And it says they're built, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Does the church today have a foundation? Yes, it does. And it is the apostles and prophets with Christ as the chief cornerstone. And here it is right here. Here's the foundation. Through the apostles and the prophets, we receive the written Word of God. And as long as we have this Word of God, as long as we stand on it, we have the apostles and prophets, and we have a sure foundation. God's Word. Given to us in the New Testament especially by the apostles and the prophets the gift of Christ to the church. So he gives some apostles and prophets. And then it says here there's, a, there's another group of gifted men given by Christ to the church that is, that is meant to guide us into unity. And by the way, as long as we stand on this together, we will stand united. Amen? And, uh, and so he gives now, uh, in verse 11, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so, we're familiar with the term evangelist, right? Uh, and, and we have, from time to time, evangelists come and speak here. We had uh, Brother Jonathan Washer not too long ago. He's an evangelist uh, that, that came and, and preached in the Taylorville prison and preached here at our church. And, um, but uh, and what is an evangelist? Well, evangelists are people who proclaim the good news. That's what it means. The, 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 uh, the noun translated evangelist, that's what it means, literally. Someone who proclaims the good news. It's a herald, or he's a herald. And, and in the book of Acts, we have a good example of an evangelist. His name is Philip. Philip the evangelist in Acts chapter 21, verse 8. The next day... We, um, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we, in, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and abode with him. And so Philip here is called the evangelist. And to be called an evangelist, uh, you have to do more than call yourself an evangelist. <laughs> All right? Philip was called an evangelist here by Luke under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So he, we know him to be an evangelist. In Acts chapter 8, the Lord gives us insight into Philip's evangelistic ministry. Uh, Philip is, is, um, he, he is shown by direction of the Holy Spirit. He sees a man from Ethiopia reading the Bible. Now there's a great way to have a witness encounter, right? You see a guy reading the Bible, walks up to him and says, Do you understand what you're reading? He's reading Isaiah 53. Uh, and... The Ethiopian man says, how can I understand? Uh, no one's here to teach me. And Philip says, oh, I'm here to teach you. And the Bible says, beginning of that very same passage, he preached to him Christ. Until the point where, the, where he says, what hinders me to be baptized? He says, do you believe? He says, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God as my Savior. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. And there he baptizes him. 
that is evangelism. Evangelism takes many, many, uh, many different uh, uh, shades, different, different uh, views, uh, but basically uh, it has many different results. Sometimes the result of evangelism isn't someone coming to Christ, but someone hearing the gospel. If someone has heard the gospel, evangelism has taken place. Uh, and that is, that is our goal, is to preach the gospel. Jesus Christ said uh, in, in, Luke, or in Mark chapter 16, uh, go and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Uh, so that is our goal. That is, that is the purpose of every, every believer. Christ has given every Christian that responsibility to evangelize, to share the gospel with the lost, but he has also given the gift of evangelist to some. There are people who have an, uh, a God-given gift. That they are able, for some reason, they have the boldness, they have uh, the, the skills that Christ has given to them, and, and as they exercise that gift, they get better at it. They just simply have the gift of evangelism. There's no other way to explain it. Um, consequently, Every mature church ought to have some immature believers in it. Because if there are immature believers in the church, evangelism has taken place. It's, it's, uh, it means that someone has given the gospel to a lost person. That lost person has received Christ. And now they're attending the church as an immature believer. They stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, they, they look different. Uh, be, and they maybe talk different. Uh, have a totally different lifestyle because they've just come out of that. Oh, we need immature believers in our church to become mature, do we not? We need to be focused on the responsibility of evangelism. Evangelism is certainly the responsibility of every pastor. Now sit tight, I'm going to preach to myself for a minute, all right? And uh, maybe you can take it easy, but Paul instructed Timothy the pastor at the church of Ephesus, to do the work of an evangelist. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 5, Paul's about to get killed. He's about to be martyred for the faith, and he's writing to Timothy, and he's saying to Timothy, uh, here are some last instructions. We need to get this done. I need to have you working the work that God has given you to do. In 2 Timothy 4 5, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Now, I ask as I preach to myself, I ask you, please pray for me to do this work. Uh, I don't do it enough. I need to do it more. I need to do it better. I think every Christian can say that. But as the pastor of this church, as I look at the Word of God, I know it is my primary responsibility. Uh, if anybody in the church is to do the work of the evangelist, it ought to be the pastor. Uh, it ought to be the pastor who leads in the, in the work of witnessing to the lost, of meeting people where they are, and giving them the gospel of Jesus Christ. I ask that you would pr please pray for me to try to win souls to Christ. This gift, this work ought to be the highest priority, or one of the highest priorities of every local church, so that we would have immature believers, new Born babes in Christ here in the church. Pastors and evangelists are gifted men that Christ has given to the church. Pastors translates the word poimen, which normally has a meaning of being a shepherd. All right? And so he's given evangelists, he's given pastors and teachers. Uh, teachers, didaskaloi, has to do with the primary function of pastors. Um, if you notice... As we look at verse 11, there's a word that pops up several times. It is the word some. All right? Notice, notice with me. He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. You notice that some does not pop up between pastors and teachers. You have some there several times. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. All right? And the reason why there's not a sum between pastors and teachers is because you have one office with two functions. All right? And so you could understand this person as a pastor teacher. He is a shepherd and he is a teacher. Um, 
And so this word poimen, though, uh, pastor or shepherd, it is used a number of times in the New Testament, but in Ephesians 4.11, this is the only place in the King James Version of the Bible where it is translated with the word pastor. Every other time it is translated shepherd. Even two times that word is given to, to describe Jesus Christ as our great shepherd in Hebrews and 1 Peter. And so what is the best way for a pastor to shepherd the flock of Christ? What is, what is the best way uh, for, for the, the pastor to lead the flock and feed the flock of Christ? Well, the best way is to feed them the word of God. That's what uh, the Apostle Peter was talking about when he wrote to a group of elders uh, and he encouraged them to feed the flock of Christ, who's, to, to whom they've been given as overseers. And so the Lord has given the church, these gifted men, apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastor teachers. That's the description of them. And, and their design is here given to us also. What do they do? Who are they? They're pastors and teachers. They're apostles and prophets. What do these gifted men do? Well, they equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Look at verse 12. He's given them... And the, and then verse 12 starts with four. This is intentional. This is what they do. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. <clears throat> what do these gifted men do? They equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That is their job. The word perfecting here. In verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Here it means to make something complete or someone complete. To give what was lacking. And thus, if they were lacking equipment, to give them equipment. To equip those who would serve Christ. So that they have everything they need to do what they should for the Lord. That's what it means to perfect the saints, to equip the saints. There are at least two tools at least two tools that can equip the saints, that can be utilized for the equipping of the saints. And the first one we've touched on is the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, again, writing to the pastor of the church of Ephesians, or Ephesus, writing to Timothy, and he tells him about this tool. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, or complete, or equipped. All right? Truly furnished unto all good works. Completely equipped with everything that he needs unto all good works. That's what the Word of God does. It is a tool that will equip you. You say, well, I need to do the work of evangelists. How can I do that? Get into the Word of God. And when it speaks about the Gospel, when it speaks about your responsibility, take it to heart. And ask God for that gift. Ask Him for that gift for me too. So I would do it with you. And so the Word of God equips the saints. And it is the work of these gifted men. Apostles and prophets brought the Word to us. Pastors and teachers and, and evangelists teach the Word to us. And uh, lead us in that unity. And then the second, the second tool here is prayer. A tool that helps equip the saints. The apostles knew this and they made it their priority. Uh, prayer was for them as important as the Word of God. When, when a particular need arose uh, in the church at Jerusalem, there were widows that were being neglected in the daily ministration, so they appointed seven men to meet that need so that they could continue, these apostles continue to minister the Word and in prayer. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 4 they say, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. There's no point in me standing up here and preaching or coming to visit or preparing a message unless there is prayer involved, unless God is in, in control, unless He's consulted, unless He leads. They that build a house, if they, unless the Lord builds it, we labor in vain that build this house. House. And so it must be the goal of every minister of the gospel to perfect the saints, to equip them. 
And here's what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, to this end. He said, whom we preach, warning every man, talking about preaching Christ, and warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect or complete or equipped in Christ Jesus. That is the goal of the minister of the gospel. What do they, what do we equip the saints for? You don't need equipment if you're not going to do anything, right? Um, and so what, for what do, do we equip the saints? They equip the saints to build up the body of Christ. That's what equipping the saints is for. To build up the body of Christ. That is the job. First of all, it's Christ who builds the church, but He wants to do that through you. He wants to do that through the members of the church. They equip the saints for the work of the ministry here in verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. Church members must care for each other's needs. They must pray for each other. They must continue to lift each other up in prayer. That's why we have a prayer list. That's why we have prayer meeting. That's why we have prayer request time. That's why we have corporate prayer. It is a vital part of the ministry of this church. Church membership is not like a country club membership where you join, you pay your dues, and then wait for somebody to bring your, 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 uh, your dinner and your drink to you. And wait for someone to wait on you. That's, that's a country club. This is church. You join, and you, you don't really pay dues. You may give something in the offering plate. And then, you look for someone to minister to. That is the building up of the body of Christ. He says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Edifying means building up in the work of the ministry. All these things run together is building up the body of Christ. It's the responsibility of these gifted men to equip the saints for this work of the ministry and to equip them to build up the body of Christ. And that is my responsibility here. That is any pastor's responsibility. What then is the goal of all this? The goal of all this is the subject of this sermon. The goal of all this is to bring the church into maturity. To come to the perfect man. Um, to come to complete man and mature manhood in Christ Jesus. And how do we know when that point has been reached? What is the measurement by which we may judge if a church is becoming mature? It's found in verse 13. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and all, in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. And here is, here is the measure. Under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So Jesus is this tall and when we're this tall we're... We're measuring up, all right? That's kind of a simplistic way to say it, but, but it is God's goal for this church, for every Christian, to be conformed into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 29. Now, this applies to me directly according to this passage. I'm one of those gifted men. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. Um, I, I don't do the work of evangelist as much as I ought to do. But God is made me a pastor. This is an extremely serious responsibility. It is my goal to make sure that you, uh, to, that I've done my part to feed you the Word of God, to lift you up in prayer every day, to, to uh, do that work. And so I ask, do I do the work of evangelists as I should? And I think the answer to that is no. I, do, do I equip the saints diligently? Do I give myself to the Word and to prayer? And those are the questions that I have to wrestle with and answer as a pastor. And I have to answer to Christ to those things. You say, well, maybe you feel kind in your heart and say, well, pastor, don't go easy on yourself. Well, I don't answer to you directly. Someday I'm going to answer to Christ for that. That is a, that is a heavy weight. Um, in my life, I don't walk around feeling that weight as much as I should, really. But that is a great responsibility. How about to you? Uh, are you focused on the work of the ministry in this church? Is that your focus? The work of the ministry. Who? Let me ask you this question. Who are you building? 
Have you identified someone who had a need and been able to help build them? Maybe just a little bit here or a little bit there. Who are you building as a member of the body of Christ? How are you building? Are you willing and receptive enough to be equipped for the ministry? We joke about don't get a pillow and uh, some people joke about sleeping in the service and, and Britt tries to, but Valerie elbows him and keeps him awake, all right? But uh, we do joke about that, but are you willing to be receptive of the Word of God and be built and, and be equipped for the ministry? Are you digging on your own for those things? Is it your goal to edify, to build up the body of Christ rather than tear down? You know, building up is much more difficult than tearing down. That's why you have to go to school for years to be an architect, but not to be an arson, right? You don't have to study to be a vandal. You're born with that ability, right? If you ever had young children, you know. They don't even have to work at it. They don't even have to perfect that ability. They have it. Born with it. We all are. Uh, it takes much more work to build up than it does to tear down. That's why so many people are so good at tearing down and so few build up. But it takes the work of Christ ministering through the members of the body to do that. Christ gives us several marks of a mature church. And the first mark is unity in Christ. Unity involves equipping the saints. It involves, it involves ministering to each other and building up the body of Christ. And unity is built on these two pillars of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Um, and Christ gives these gifted men to guide the church in that unity. Are you in tune with the apostles and prophets? Are you benefiting from them? Um, and and uh, uh, that is God's gift, Jesus' gift to the church. And so we will move on next week to the next mark of maturity. But we began this message reading some some notes to pastors from children. I want to finish up reading from, reading, um, these are, I believe, from TomRainer.com, and these are a survey of things that pastors have heard from church members, actually said to them, and usually during the service, right before the message. Um, here are some, these are from adults, all right? Here's one, we need a small group for cat lovers. All right. How about this one? You need to change your voice. And by the way, uh, the author of the article writes in parentheses his response that he would give to that. Uh, so you need to ch change your voice. And he says, yes, ma'am, I'll, uh, I'll try having that done by next week. Um, how about this one? Our expensive coffee is attracting too many hipsters. <laughs> yep, you don't want too many of those hipsters in your church. Preachers who don't wear suits and ties aren't saved. It's in the Bible. <laughs> I should have known that's what Jesus and Paul wore, right? How about this? Your socks are distracting. <laughs> yeah, it could be me, right? I understand. I'll stop wearing socks. You shouldn't make people leave the youth group after they graduate. Okay. It's going to get really weird by the time they're in their 70s. I don't like the color of the towels in the women's restroom. How about this one? We need to start attracting more normal people at church. And then he puts in parentheses, so I guess you'll be leaving next week, huh? Um, my wife, your wife never compliments me about my hair or dress. And he puts in parentheses, there could be a reason for that, but... Not enough people signed up for the church golf tournament. You have poor leadership skills. All right. Uh, and he says, I'm sorry, I expected more since most of the deacons play golf on Sunday morning, right? Uh, uh, let's see here. Jesus sang from the red hymnals, Why Can't We? Actually, I think Jesus sang from the blue hymnals, but all right. Um, Here's someone said to a pastor who married interracially, you're living in sin, you shouldn't be married to each other. That one is not worthy of commentary put in there. 
Um, someone put, I don't like the brand of donuts in the foyer. And here's a complaint. You did not wrap the hot dogs in bacon for the church picnic. I think that actually is valid. So um, you shouldn't drink water when you preach. The toilet paper is on the wrong way in the ladies' restroom. It's rolled under. Obviously, it can't function that way. Uh, why don't you ever preach on Tim Tebow? Be patient. I have a six-week six expository series on him in the fall. All right, so there are several things. Those, there's more. Those are from adults. All right? And so to be immature, you don't have to just be young, do you? But Christ has given us, given us two pillars. The, the faith to be united around the knowledge of the Son of God. And then he's given us uh, these gifted men and, and given us uh, these men to guide us into, into unity of the faith and into, into a unity in Christ. Now, I have spent two sermons preaching the first point of a sermon. And I feel bad. I even went long today trying to get in the first point. And so we'll try and get through the rest of it next week. But are we doing our part? Are you, are you uh, really um, committed to the maturity and the unity of our church? Let's stand together.